web series about sports broadcasting. I'm Jack McShane. Now our guest this week is Alyssa Rose. Alyssa is a social media correspondent for the New York Mets. Now her dad, Howie Rose, is the radio voice of the Mets, but Alyssa didn't always set out to follow in his footsteps. Now coming up, you're going to hear how the cancellation of a soap opera put her on her current path. But with no major sports happening during the coronavirus, we began by talking about the importance of having baseball back. So my take on all of this is I am on the side. I have two kind of views, right? Like I have the Alyssa Rose, the baseball fan side, and I have the Alyssa Rose, the employee who would like to work side. So my goal, I want baseball and I don't care how it gets done. And I don't care who kind of makes concessions where, but I also understand from the standpoint of the players, like you want to feel like you're, you're, you know, getting what you signed on for kind of. And for the owners, it's like, we need to make sure that this works for us. So I'm definitely not one of those people who's like all player, all owner. I want everyone to come together in a time where the country is as divisive and as scary and as divided as it's ever been. I need the players and the owners and everyone involved to come together to find something that is going to mutually work for everyone, that is going to make everyone across the board happy and let fans watch America's pastime. If the NBA can figure it out, if uh, you know, the NHL can figure it out, I am so certain, like beyond anything, I am so certain that the MLB is going to figure it out. We are going to have baseball and the fans are gonna, we're just gonna be so happy. Like I can't, I can't imagine any kind of happiness that I've like ever felt before. Like that'll be like the happiness when I watch the first pitch of the 2020 season. Right, because I mean, the difficult part is that the players are taking a risk when they go into these games, because a lot of the times, I mean, some people don't know that these, some of these players may have underlying conditions that they may not want to play in. So you kind of get it from that perspective. But then when you're looking at it from a fan's perspective, it's like, we just need sports on. So yeah. I think that's definitely important. And, and like you said, it like impacts your job, right? Because you do social media for the Mets, right? So There's the more games you go to, the better. Tweeting. Yeah, so I don't do any of the tweeting. I don't post right. the content. I'm the on-camera person for our social media. So like for me, not only do I miss watching the players play, but I miss talking to the players. I miss, mm -hmm. you know, the interviews that I do, while yes, they're for social and they're for the fans and it's great, they're so meaningful to me. Like to get, my whole life is baseball. It's like the only thing I care about besides my friends and family. Like <laughs> baseball is it for me I'm lead orange and blue if you caught me open like for me to get insight into what's actually going on in the players heads that other people may not know or to understand exactly what's going on in the locker room it's it makes me feel like I've accomplished like the only thing I've ever wanted to do in my entire life so like I miss that sense of accomplishment I miss that sense of like belonging somewhere like I really just need baseball back <laughs> So when you say you're like you're an on-camera social media person, you're doing interviews with players that are in the majors and minors, right? Because I saw you did some stuff at spring training, and that was yeah. that must have been pretty cool, right? Really cool, especially because when I say like I was interviewing kids, like I was interviewing kids, which is really like, yeah. awesome. Like I was talking about someone who just came out of high school who was about to go live out his dream. That mm. is so awesome to me. Like you have no idea what is in store for the rest of your life, but you know that you have made it before you've even, you know, had your 18th birthday. That was really cool. Um, I interview the players. I interview alumni of the team. I interview celebrities when they're in the building, which is really cool. I know last, I think it was in September, uh, Mariska Hargitay from Law & Order SVU, which I think that show has been on the air for 21 years. I've right. seen every single episode. She threw out the first pitch. I went to my boss. I said, we need to grab a cameraman. We need to grab sound. Like, we need to interview Mariska Hargitay. And we, we cut a promo for the, for the upcoming season. So that was really cool. That's, yeah. No, that's really cool. And especially for these players, you know, being able for you to really, you know, talk to them as they're beginning to live out their dreams and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. And getting to bring players of other sports together. I'm constantly thinking about, like, what do the fans want to see? What do people on social want to interact with? And when the PLL launched last year, I mm. took a total shot in the dark and I just DM'd Paul Rabel on Instagram. And I was like, hey, is there any shot you'd have any interest in coming down to City Field, shooting some content? And he's all about social. Right. He's totally. And he came, he brought 100 tickets to the upcoming PLL weekend in New York at Red Bull. Um, and Pete Alonzo used to play lacrosse. So Pete Alonzo and Paul Rabel are standing on the, you know, on the warning track, just like 
shooting around a lacrosse stick. I don't, I don't speak lacrosse. I don't know if that's <laughs> Neither do I, yeah. But like throwing around a lacrosse ball with their sticks and like that's the kind of stuff I love. Like being able to bring people from other, you know, parts of the sports world together and kind of facilitate conversations and facilitate um, content. I love that. Now, another question I have that we probably never really thought of ever is like, how are media going to be affected when sports comes back, especially with social distancing between the players? Because I mean, players, a lot of times, you know, they speak out, oh, we don't like the media. I mean, some players kind of talk like that, but I mean, media is part of the game. So like, how do you, what is, how are post-game locker rooms going to look like now um, after games, even press conferences with managers and stuff? Yeah. I, I don't even know if I'll be allowed. It's going to obviously depend on if fans are allowed, but I don't know right. if I'll even be allowed to to go to City Field if it, when when baseball comes back. Uh, I don't know if I'll be allowed there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do anything on social, if it would have to be like we're doing now through Zoom, if I'll be allowed to be in the ballpark. I can't imagine they're going to let me in the clubhouse this season. I don't know how that's going to work. What I'm more concerned about, honestly, is my father because mm. he's 66 years old and right. the travel that would be involved. Are they going to have him call road games on the road? Is he going to have to call them from a studio? I don't know how that's going to work. So that's actually what my main concern is because I'm young, I'm healthy, young, eh, but I'm healthy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not concerned so much about that, but my dad, who's also, thank God, healthy, but 66 years old, you, you know, pay attention to the numbers and who COVID affects. That's kind of where my underlying concern is. Yeah, because it's like stuff you never would ever think you'd have to think about, you know, yeah. like, especially with play-by-play. -play and just the most important thing is making sure these people stay healthy. Exactly. Now, your dad, Howie Rose, is a Hall of Fame sports broadcaster. Now, I noticed that you went to Quinnipiac and you majored in drama. And then you also yeah. went into sales and business and nothing to do with anything in the sports industry. So was your initial plan to follow in his footsteps or did you want to do something else? Yeah, so I'll tell you straight up. I went to Quinnipiac because of their broadcast journalism program. Mm -hmm. And I uh, wanted to be, I was going to be Pam Oliver. So I think I'm a little older. This is before Erin Andrews was like the girl. Right. I wanted to be Pam Oliver. She was my idol. I wanted to be an NFL sideline reporter. Uh, I have since like lost as much interest in the NFL, but I think it's because the Giants are just so disappointing all the time that it's kind of hard to like right. really sustain it for 16 weeks. But um, my first day, of my second semester of my freshman year, I had a meeting with my advisor and he said, what do you want to do? So I told him I want to be an NFL sideline reporter. And he was like, great, sounds good. There are about four people who have that job and they're not retiring anytime soon. Mm. So like, what's your backup? And then the next day, I uh, just for fun, the first semester of college, I wanted to just focus on like learning how to study because like I was, not much of a studier in high school. So I was like, right. I'm gonna learn how to get good grades. Um, so I didn't do anything extracurricular. And then I was always a theater kid in high school and I decided to audition for my first play at school. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget this. You know, you fill out like your audition sheet where you right. perform, you're in what your major is. And at 11 o'clock at night on a Tuesday night, the director of the play called me into his office. And I was like, he's gonna tell me like before a cast list, goes up like that was the worst audition I've ever seen like I'm saving you the trouble like don't ever oh, right in collegiate again and he just sits me down and he says I'm looking at your audition sheet and it says that you are a broadcast journalism major I'm curious why not drama and I said well you know I don't think that acting is like a realistic career and he said it's not for most people it is for you switch into wow. my program so I had one person essentially telling me I can't do what I want to do and another person telling me that I could do what like every kid dreams of doing when they grow up. So I was young, I was 18, I was impressionable. I didn't even ask my parents. I on the spot signed a, a, a change of major form. And I studied theater the whole time I was in college. Uh, my senior year of Quinnipiac winter break, I got cast on a soap opera on ABC. Uh, and I thought that was it, that was my life. I mean, One Life to Live had been on the air for 43 years. Um, once you're on, you're on like, unless, right. you know, they don't really write characters out. So I was like, this is amazing. I, I always wanted a career where I was never going to be like famous. Um, because I wanted, a, I want to be a mom one day. That's super important to me. And I always wanted to be around for my kids. Um, so I, I, soap acting was like it for me, right? It's a nine to five job. They film Monday through Friday. It's a steady work. And unless, you know, you're a housewife, no one really knows who you are. 
Like no one's stopping you in the street. Um, so it was like perfect for me. And then six, uh, six months. Yeah. Six months into casting me. So opera started going off the air show got canceled. And I was like, well, I need to figure something out now. Uh, I have no skills that I learned in college that weren't based in acting. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, hired me at his company, uh, his sales company. And I was really good at sales and I loved it because I was so good at it, but I didn't love it because I was like passionate about it necessarily. Uh, I just liked making money. And one day, like some twist of fate in 2015, uh, Barstool Sports made shirts that said, put it in the books, which, you know, is what my dad says when the Mets win games. Right. I reached out to them to get some for my dad. Uh, and one thing led to another and it became one podcast, which then became a video show, which then led to the seven line finding me and having me blog for them, which is what led to the Mets finding me. So all of this was like weird twists of fate that happened along the way. But I never said like, while the Mets are my first love and my biggest love and like a dream come true to work for them. I never thought I'm going to work for the Mets because I never wanted to feel like I was using my dad to get a job. So then when it happened on its own without, my dad didn't even know they were hiring me. I called right. him and I said, when were you planning on telling me we were going to be coworkers? And he said, what are you talking about? He had, and I didn't like interview for a job or anything. They just called me one day and said, this is what we're thinking. Would you do it? So like it, everything came out of left field. And I feel like every little step that I took to get there kind of obviously shaped the path, but it was a unique path for sure. That's crazy. It's almost like you benefited from the soap opera coming off the air. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it led to so many things one after the other. Now I'm sure it's awesome to be able to be a coworker with your dad working in a major league organization. Most thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Now I noticed that your dad also got Twitter too, which is a pretty crazy thing. He and he also got a lot more hair, which I noticed. These COVID, no haircut, no shaving things, have, they got to stop. Your dad does not look like he has stopped taking care of his hair or face at all. My dad's like, I'm just letting it all go. Yeah, I noticed. I noticed. But he's been pretty active on the Twitter, I noticed. You Plus, started him on that, right? I had been begging him to get onto social media forever. A, because he was constantly having me look for things for him. And I was like, right. you could just do this yourself or like wanting me to get messages out there. But he was always very hesitant because I mean, if you've ever listened to a broadcast, like, you know, he doesn't hold back. Like he says what he's thinking when he's thinking it. And mm -hmm. he also is a fan of red wine. And he was like, one day I'm going to have one, you know, too many glasses. And then I'm going to say something that mm, maybe I shouldn't have said, and I'm going to get myself into some trouble. But I think he sees now that he's on it. And he's so, not only was he so bored, when quarantining all started, but he mm. was so hungry for like connection with Mets fans and with baseball fans. That right. He was like, I'm just going to do it, whatever. Um, and I think he sees now, like it is really just a way to interact with people who love and care about the things that you love and care about. Right. Yeah. And one last question that I want to end sure. with here is that where do you see yourself five, 10 years down the line? Like what is next for you? Like, well, do you have any dad, idea? I have this conversation with my dad every day and with my right. mom. Um, if you said to me, genie, bottle, take, like it's anything that you want, you can wish it and it will happen. I would like to be with the New York Mets until the day I die. Mm -hmm. um, my kind of goal, and I love the social aspect of what I do. I think social media is the future. Uh, I could talk to you forever about like the numbers behind cord cutting and how people uh, in my generation and certainly in your generation are not paying for cable anymore. Right. Um, it's a little bit harder to watch the games. I would love to kind of be uh, the, the sideline reporter for baseball, kind of like Steve Galbs is on mm. social. So I would love to be at, you know, working every single game home and on the road, um, you know, maybe on the field, like interviewing players in the dugout between innings, um, or things like that that are streaming directly to social. That's a vision that I've had for a very long time. I don't know that it's something that uh, the MLB is necessarily ready for. I think that, you know, maybe um, logistics behind streaming and things like that, they have a way to go, not just necessarily on the baseball end, but on the social platform end. Um, but that, that would be my dream job. That is what I wanted. It's what I love doing. It's what I want to do. It's the mixture of the social media and the on-camera. Um, if I could make that my career, that's what I would want. If that's not possible, and you would say your second choice of anything, 
Um, it would be a, a desk host at MLB Network or something like that. So being just involved in baseball is kind of your oh. main goal for the rest of your life, right? Whenever my parents say like, okay, you know, because full time I'm still in sales. Right. Um, my parents say like, you know, you need to like really, I'm going to be 31 years old next month. Like you need to like nail down your, your future and what you're going to do. I tell them every single time I refuse to do anything that's not going to make me happy and nothing is going to make me happy. That's not baseball. So like, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, especially with your dad playing a huge influence on you and him being in baseball now for a, decades. I mean, it would be yeah. great for you to be with him for as long as you can. Exactly. My dad uh, was a beat reporter for the Mets. I'm pretty sure uh, in 86. Mm -hmm. So he's been with that. And I wasn't born until 89. So all I know is the Mets. Like they are in my DNA, they're in my blood. Um, and they're, they're all I want. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Alyssa Rose for joining me this week on Jack in the Booth. Tune in next week for episode three, where I'll be joined by Keith Irizarry, a host on NHL Network, among other things. Thanks for watching. I'm Jack McChain.